Hello and welcome to a Critical Dragon, where I talk about now in film, television and in books. And this is carrying on from my previous two videos talking about description and, and how authors do it. Because while the first one talked about using a sequence that mimics eye movement, and the second one was talking about how character can focalize and pick up on specific information, there's another aspect of it that I think is important, and that is despite the fact that we are inundated with the sort of preponderance of audio visual information in film and television that is the dominant form of a lot of mass media there are other senses and when authors use additional senses in their descriptions not just describing the visuals and not just describing the sound because we're used to what we can see in the text the sound of the dialogue. And we are used to that being the dominant form because of how film and television dominate not only our narrative experience, but also the narrative experience of authors. And so it is a natural style to mimic, but we do have other senses. And one of the tricks that authors use is by using tactile information or olfactory information, or the taste of something, so taste, smell, or touch. By using these additional senses, they can create a much more immersive world. That it's not just like looking at a film and listening to a soundtrack. That it's not just like watching a TV show and hearing what the characters are saying that this takes advantage of the fact that we as reader are imagining this world that what the words on the page are describing is being created in our minds and because of that it can in a lot of respects go further than film and television because it can immerse us in new details so I'm going to go through an example here, and this is from William Gibson's uh, Count Zero, actually, one of the sprawl novels. And it is a description of part of the sprawl. Bobby climbed down behind him into the unmistakable signature smell of the sprawl, a rich amalgam of steel subway exhalations, ancient soot, and the carcinogenic tang of fresh plastics, all of it shot through with the carbon edge of illicit fossil fuels. High overhead, in the reflected glare of arc lamps, one of the unfinished fuller domes shut out two-thirds of the salmon pink evening sky its ragged edge like broken gray honeycomb the sprawl's patchwork of domes tended to generate inadvertent microclimates there were areas of a few city blocks where a fine drizzle of condensation fell continually off the soot-stained geodesics and sections of high dome famous for displays of static discharge, a peculiar urban variety of lightning. So the first thing that I want to mention here is obviously this begins with a very rich examination of the smells, the aromas coming from this particular location. And then it moves into aspects of light and visual aspects and then we get down into the microclimate discussion which contains within it obviously something that is quite tactile but all the way through this we see how Gibson is using various ways of describing things to not only give us a sense of the thing being described but to do it in an interesting way so for instance, this is the unmistakable signature smell of the sprawl. And it's a rich amalgam, not a stink or um, an odor or a miasma, a rich amalgam. So it's that sort of heady, deep, full sense of smell. And it is something that is not described negatively, despite the fact that we have lots of negative associations worked into this. Steel subway exhalations, 
ancient soot, carcinogenic tang of fresh plastics, that this is all about that contradictory, um, contrasting notions of smell and how it can create in the person perceiving it, it is triggering certain memories, it is triggering certain responses. And things that we regard as bad smells can actually have positive associations. Um, I don't know about you, but if you've ever driven through the countryside and the, the smell of the countryside, you think, oh, the, the fresh air and the smell of manure on the fields. But if that is associated with pleasant memories, that manure smell can actually be described in both a positive and negative light at the same time. But getting back to, to Gibson's description, this idea of the steel subway exhalations, but it is then contrasted actually at the end of that with the fresh plastics. And not only that, the smell of the carcinogenic tang of fresh plastics is actually giving that taste at the back of your throat where something that you smell, you can taste in the back of your mouth. And Gibson has worked this in. And then shot through all of this are different textures because we have that idea of, well, exhalations, something that is very airy, but soot has that fluffy uh, softness to it. Tang is sharp. Carbon edge is obviously, again, a sharpness. And then when we hear about, or more accurately, read, the ragged edge broken gray honeycomb and so the description is going into tactile descriptors so that it is not just visualizing something we can almost feel it and then when we think of how Gibson describes the fine drizzle of condensation that again is giving us this more than deep humidity more than very high humidity. It is actually that um, very, very light rainfall. And all of this is shot through then with very startling images. The salmon pink evening sky, the peculiar urban variety of lightning. We see that Gibson is really reaching down and giving us very full, very rich descriptions that are helping us imagine this in more than just audio visual but another interesting aspect about this as i had said before about the um the sequence where something is described we can see here we have a sequence we've moved through smell then we're going through aspects of light that are revealing that are revealing um, buildings. And then when we get to the buildings, we get to the microclimate and then the microclimate ends off with lightning. So there is a progression all the way through of one type of description after another. We are moving through senses. So there is a tracking of this. And if we think of someone descending down into something like this, we can imagine, yes, you first get hit by the smell, then you're looking around and you're seeing it, and then you start to feel it because now you're down in it. So you get that sense of progression, this movement through that is following a narrative sequence, and it is matched with Bobby climbed down. And because of that, we get this sense of movement down into this. And that's why that whole sequence of events, that sequence of descriptions, follows that pattern. And the last thing that I want to bring up about this. So obviously, we talked about descriptions being visual. They show us what we are looking at, what the character is looking at. And in the last video, I talked about how that can be revealing about how a character feels about the subject or it can be an aspect of characterization, or it can be a way for the author to manipulate how we, the reader, are going to feel about a subject. And you can see elements of that here. You can see how those positive and negative words are being used. 
to create a complex image, one that is not clear cut. But more than that, it is an evocation of atmosphere. It is creating a sense of the place beyond our five senses. It is creating an immersive reality. And because of that, we are getting aspects of this sort of detective noir, this darkness. This is one of these aspects of cyberpunk writing that becomes so commonplace. If you think of the opening sequence of Blade Runner with the, the neon and the, the acid rain and the press of humanity and the big billowing uh, clouds of steam coming out off the ground and everything in darkness and then harsh neon light shining across things. That creates an aesthetic, that creates an atmosphere, it creates a sense of the place that is more than the sum of its parts. So I think you can see from that example that what we talked about in uh, describing things from head to toe and following a natural sequence, we have something similar here. There is a narrative logic to the sequence of descriptions, and it fits with, you know, how we would encounter it. We have seen how in the previous video we talked about the different ways of describing something can make us feel something for it. And again, we see that here. But even more so here, we are getting a complete sense of place, an atmosphere, an aesthetic, a, uh, I suppose the modern term would be a vibe of how this place looks and feels, what it is like to be there, not just see it on a screen, but to actually be there. And when we are aware of how authors use the different senses, because describing the tactile nature of something, the grain of wood suddenly makes that wooden object seem much more real than it was a mahogany table. But if their fingers move across the grain of the wood, we can almost imagine that. When we get the various descriptions, say, of battlefields, but then we get the smell of the battlefield. It can be much more real. It can be more evocative. And so this is how, or it's one of the ways, you should always say one of the ways, one of the ways that, again, authors create more immersive realities within their fiction. And they make it feel natural. And they do it as a way to manipulate us, as a way to get us more immersed, more engaged in their descriptions, in their worlds, in their fictive realities. So I hope you've enjoyed this one. Uh, again, trying to keep these short and I will see you in the next one.